This is Ralph Rensler, director of the Smithsonian Bicentennial Folklife Festival. If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. and said, how are we going to make this work? For 10 years, Tangled Bank Studios has been telling stories about science. This is amazing. And about the people who make sense of our world. Wow. Mavericks, who have gone where no one else has gone. They went out into the world and just followed their passion. We were on our way. Seeing what no one else has seen. It is spectacular. You could hear people just, whoa. Done what no one else has done. It's never been at this speed before. This is not just a drill. This is the real thing. But the world is at a turning point. This is a moment of truth. And the actions humanity takes in the next 10 years. We have to build an army of scientists around the world. Will determine the future of life on Earth. As we hurtle toward that future, Tangled Bank is doubling down, committed as ever to spotlighting the pioneers. They saw the world in such a different way. The change makers. All right, that's amazing. Who are pushing the bounds of science. It was like knocking on eternity's door. And whose stories will inspire a new generation. This is your time. This is your day. These are the stories that can change the world. No matter what happens, keep doing it. Stories that spark action. Yes, we will fight this. Stories that stir wonder. <laughs> stories that inspire hope. Woo! Everything changed. What a privilege to be there at that moment, to be able to see it that way. Tangled Bank Studios, celebrating 10 unforgettable years. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Smithsonian Folklife Festival. For over 50 years, the festival has convened people on the National Mall to explore the power of culture and creativity in our lives today. This year, we feature artists and partners from the United Arab Emirates and Earth Optimism, a global conservation movement. The Smithsonian Folklife Festival is produced by the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage in partnership with the National Park Service. The festival strives to maintain an accessible and inclusive environment for visitors of all abilities. If you are in need of accessible seating options or assistive listening devices during this presentation, please vid visit with our venue manager sitting right over here. This festival is made possible by people like you, and this year with additional support provided by the Timoshev Family Foundation. Festival hours are 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. with special events taking place most evenings beginning at 6.30. The most up-to-date information on schedules, performers, and more is available at the website festival.si.edu. Please be considerate of our recycling program and make sure if you want to discard items, you put them in their proper receptacles. And we encourage you to visit our festival marketplace over by the National Museum of Asian Art, right on the other side of the castle. 
And I'd like to give an additional thank you to HHMI Tangled Bank Studios for helping to make this particular session possible today. And speaking of which, welcome to Livelihoods and Landscapes. Our moderator today is Julie Robinson, Belize Program Director of the Nature Conservancy, joined by Delphine Mukira, Chief Program Officer, Ma Trust, Semi Lotawa, did I do it right? Lotawa? Okay, good. Uh, co founder and operations manager, Rise Beyond the Reef, Phil Carr, citizen scientist, ocean activist, advocate. Michael Judd, founder, Ecologia, Ecologia and Silvo Culture. And uh, on screen, we're joined by Allison Sant, who uh, is buzzing in from somewhere in the world on her busy travel schedule, co-founder and partner, Studio for Urban Projects. Thank you so much, enjoy. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for being with us today. I have the distinct pleasure of sitting here with this amazing group of people to really talk to you and to have a panel discussion and an engaging discussion with the audience about people and the planet and about the stories that we really want to share to inspire, to really show that we actually can thrive together. In a time when there is so much uncertainty around, you know, you turn on a television, you, there's storms, there's droughts, there's fires, but there are also these beautiful sparks, these islands out there that, where we can show that things can and do work together, and we must do this. So what I want to do is I would like to, first of all, introduce my amazing panel that come from all over the world. And I'll first start off with Delphine. So Delphine Mukira is the Chief Program Officer at the Ma Trust. She coordinates education, health, and wash, child rights, women and youth empowerment, sustainable livelihoods, and conservation programs at the Trust. She previously worked in a conservation organization in Mount Kenya region, managing a health program which focuses on population, health, and environment. Next to Delphine, we have Semi Lotawa, and he is a co-founder and operations manager of RISE Beyond the Reef. He is an indigenous Fijian from Nalatoa village, where he grew up in a traditional setting. He attended a remote boarding school and is one of about 5% of students from his district that graduated from high school. Semi pursued a degree in business in the United States where, with an intent to secure investment from the private sector markets to support sustainable development for indigenous communities in the Pacific. Next, we have Phil Karp. Phil is an independent citizen scientist, ocean advocate, and film producer formerly with the World Bank, where he was a knowledge management and learning specialist. His work is focused on the interface between marine conservation and livelihoods, with an emphasis on empowering and creating new livelihood opportunities for coastal communities, including market-based solutions, and we'll hear a lot more about that today. And then there's also Michael Judd. Michael is the founder of Ecologia Edible and Ecological Landscape Design, as well as Project Bonafide, an international nonprofit supporting agroecology research and co founder of Silvocultural, Silvoculture, a Maryland based nonprofit, which is planting, which is helping to plant one million nut trees in the mid Atlantic region. He has worked in agroecological and whole system designs throughout the Americas for over two decades. And then finally, on the screen, we have Alison Sant. Ali is a partner and co-founder of the Studio for Urban Projects, an interdisciplinary design collaborative based in San Francisco that works at the intersection of architecture, urbanism, art, and social activism. Ali is the author, is, is the author sorry, of From the Ground Up, Local Efforts to Create Resilient Cities, a book that examines how American cities are mitigating and adapting to climate change while creating greater equity and livability. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear from each of our panelists now. They'll each provide sort of the, you know, a brief opening remarks on the work that they do, and then we'll get into a very lively discussion and then open up for answers and questions. So um, I'd like to start off with Delphine, and you know, in your context, in the Maasai Mara, how do livelihoods coexist with the landscape? Um. 
Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, uh, the Maasai community are dominantly uh, pastoral communities and they get their source of livelihood from uh, pastoralism and of course tourism because it's one of the uh, uh, tourist attractions in Kenya. Uh, however, we have seen that uh, because of uh, competition with the ecosystem, pastoralism might not be sustainable and also uh, learning from COVID-19, uh, we saw the shock that COVID can bring to the economy. And with that, then the mattress is making um, in, uh, interventions to ensure that we can try and empower communities for them to be able to diversify I income. And we are working with women and youth, uh, uh, empowering them in different areas from beekeeping to beadwork, uh, like the pieces I'm wearing today. Uh, including mushrooms, mushroom farming that they can sell to the camps in the Masai Mara to ensure that they can diversify their income. And beyond just earning an income, uh, for pastoral communities, anytime they have an extra shilling, they'll put it back and buy more sheep and more cattle. So we also try to empower them or encourage them to use the extra income or the income they're earning from oh, all these other sources of, in, uh, of income to improve their livelihood by either buying a tank uh, or even buying an energy saving GECO or even just ensuring that they can pay school fees for their children so that we do not have more, more cattle and sheep uh, in the ecosystem where it's already, um, uh, we, we are over and beyond our carrying capacity. Thank you. Okay, Semi. Um, in the Pacific Islands, this is an area where, of course, it's very um, vulnerable to climate change, things like sea level rise, um, increasing intensity of storms. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you are doing um, in order to, to deal with the, with the threat of climate change? Hello, and a big uh, bulavinaka to you all. Warm greetings from the islands of Fiji. Um, for, uh, for us, what's at stake is the total abundance mindset, the connection between uh, land, food, identity, and traditional knowledge to be self-sustaining and resilient. This is the Pacific way. In the development world, we often provide a deficit mindset without meaning to. But through cyclical projects, silo funding strategies, um, and uh, we are ex expert in exhausting rather than uh, sustaining. All too often development uh, strategies don't live beyond the assigned board. Um, frankly, if there is one thing that I've learned over the years that uh, working in Fiji is uh, culture, it's uh, strategies and foreign development framework for breakfast. So what if we align ourselves with culture? What can we learn from the total abundance mindset of the uh, indigenous Fijian community? Will it lead us to different outcomes than the Global North um, framework? How can it help us to sustain? In uh, 2014, with $5,000 in the bank, my wife and I started our flagship economic and uh, leadership uh, program in, 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 in Fiji, specifically rural and remote women. Uh, quite. Um, to address the high rates of uh, gender-based violence uh, that is common in rural and remote uh, communities in Fiji and uh, in the Pacific, there is three out of uh, two to three women uh, are being abused, double the global average. Through a listening process via our baseline uh, survey, we partner uh, with women to share what they wanted to know and how do they articulate their needs. And one thing that was clear in that process is they want to earn their own uh, incomes. Today, with uh, over 500 women uh, in our program, and before COVID, they surpassed $500,000 in earnings through our traditional contemporary arts and craft and income generating program. We have uh, been building a vessel with our partner communities via economic development uh, to provide a uh, platform targeting men to address gender-based uh, violence and other harmful norms. Using a market-driven um, approach, we were able to weave together an economic development, leadership, capacity building, preservation, and promotion of traditional knowledge, indigenous identity, and building 
uh, resilient and, and, and uh, climate adaptation. This is not a project. It's a partnership approach, working directly with rural and remote communities. And the women we work with are the leaders in this process. We need to trust the abundance of traditional knowledge, its value and leadership in climate crisis, and model the abundance in how we develop our organization for the long haul. Thank you, Sammy. Phil, um, I understand that you know, you've been involved in developing um, and promoting some very innovative approaches um, to address a threat, as we see here, faced by marine ecosystems across the Caribbean. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this? Sure, Julie. So two species of lionfish that are native to the Indo-Pacific have invaded the Western Atlantic, uh, all of coastal Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, and eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, as far north as uh, Rhode Island in the winter, <clears throat> and as far um, north as the Carolinas year-round. Um, because they have no natural predators, they reproduce rapidly, they're generalist feeders, they really are causing major damage to local marine ecosystems. Just to give an example, um, in a matter of weeks, uh, a few lionfish can reduce the population of native juvenile species by up to 80%. So basically bad news. Uh, now, there's some good news and bad news in terms of trying to address this invasion. The good news is that lionfish are really good to eat. So one of the strategies is actually trying to promote their consumption as well as developing a fishery for them. The other piece of good news is that it's clear that by reducing the populations to a certain level, native fish start to, um, uh, start to recover. The bad news is that they can't be harvested using conventional fishing gear like lines or nets. They have to be hand speared or hand netted, which is both labor intensive and expensive. So, a few years ago, um, I was working on a marine ecosystem conservation project in Belize and was basically dissecting some lionfish to look at their prey composition and had this cutting board full of discarded uh, fish guts and carcasses. And somehow it occurred to me that the fins looked like butterfly wings and that the spines looked like porcupine quills. And I had an aha moment of visualizing the beautiful jewelry that Native American women and African women make from porcupine quills and also handicrafts made from butterfly wings. And said, wow, could we do the same thing with lionfish? So I dried a few fins and spines and brought them to an artist and said, can you do something with this? And basically fast forward, um, now 12 years later, there's groups of artists uh, all over Belize and other places in the Caribbean that are making beautiful jewelry from the fins and spines of these fish. And what this is doing, it's incentivizing fishermen to actually capture more because it raises the landed value. And at the same time, it creates income opportunities and empowerment for women in coastal communities. Thanks, Phil. And then finally, Michael. Um, how can permaculture and uh, whole system design keep us rooted as the world shifts? Well, I, I see the future as nuts. Uh, I see nut trees being planted everywhere. I see chestnuts, I see hickories, I see hazelnuts. I see their roots holding the soil together. I see them supporting the water cycles above as below. I see an opportunity to stack functions when we're planting trees to make them multi-purpose. It's a lot of, a lot of projects, a lot of energy going into planting trees. So what if we made those nut trees? What if we made more of those food trees at the same time? This supports wildlife. It creates shelter and habitat for humans, animals alike. We work with permaculture. Permaculture is a word that combines permanent agriculture. It works with holistic design. It brings together landscapes. It brings together people, economies, in ways that imitate natural ecosystems. So natural ecosystems flourish with centropy. They feed themselves and they create surplus. 
So permaculture observes those healthy ecosystems and says, okay, now how do we design on our landscapes? You know, how do we go out and start planting a tree that is supported by its own system like nature does, right? That's the nutshell. Now, to these ends, um, I've helped co-found an initiative called Silvo Culture, which is working toward helping get a million nut trees planted here in the mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. And Silvo Culture is a play on words, silva meaning forest and culture meaning us that steward the trees in the forest. Just like permaculture is permanent agriculture, ways that we can work with transitioning these fields of soy and corn and monocrops to forests, forests that feed us as well, that, re that bring back the waterways and the rivers, that bring back the communities, you know, that give habitat and shelter to us. So a lot of it is looking at how do we, how can we make this idea economically viable, right? How do we change those corn and soybean and all these, these monocrop fields to, you know, healthy, thriving food forests? So silviculture and a lot of the work I do is focused on how to make this realistic economically. And it actually is, is very easy. Nuts, you know, bring in a, a very high demand. They bring in good, good income. So really it's just the vision and bringing things together. And that's what I'm focused on. Thanks, Michael. Ali, um, I have a quick question for you. In your book, From the Ground Up, uh, you describe that cities are an important part of creating climate solutions as they're responsible for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and are the places where the majority of population lives. So how are U.S. cities restoring natural ecosystems and employing people as they work to mitigate and adapt to climate change? Thanks, Julie. You know, first, I want to say how honored I am to be a part of this program, especially among such remarkable panelists who are, are addressing the environmental challenges we face by connecting the well-being of people and the health of the planet. So I wrote from the ground up because I wanted to understand the ways in which American cities are taking action to have carbon emissions and prepare for the extreme weather ahead. And what I found was that human inspiration is leading work to make cities better for the people who live in them. People are regreening their cities, they're planting urban forests, they're restoring watersheds, and they're adapting shorelines. They're making cities resilient by using nature-based solutions that create places for people instead of cars, while supporting more equitable communities in the process. And given the urgency we face, it's essential that we do more than one thing at a time. And fortunately, just as we have compound problems, we have interventions that provide compound solutions. For example, in Baltimore, Nature not only reflects systemic inequities, but also their remedies. While Baltimore's affluent neighborhoods may have as much as 50% tree canopy cover, East Baltimore's red line neighborhoods have as little as 6%, which means that on a hot day, there can be a 16 degree difference between neighborhoods in the same city. So Baltimore's urban wood project is addressing these disparities. Carbon emissions are avoided by deconstructing the city's abundant vacant row homes, to salvage the rare wood they contain, and people in need of jobs are employed in the process. Ultimately, the lots where these houses once stood are being converted to small urban forests, rebalancing tree equity and reducing urban, urban heat island effect. And it's not just urban forests that are showing how social justice and climate action can be aligned. In Portland, Oregon, people in low-income communities, such as the Latinx community in the Cully neighborhood, are earning a living building the city's ambitious green infrastructure program by restoring its watersheds with habitat-rich bioswales, rain gardens, daylighted creeks, and floodable parks. Their efforts not only benefit their own neighborhood, but the entire city. And jobs and restoration are also benefiting our urban shorelines. In the San Francisco Bay Area, Bayview Hunters Point is a neighborhood with the highest rates of home ownership among black people. It has also suffered from generations of environmental injustice. Groundbreaking policies and programs have been established there to hire local residents and employ them in the process of restoring their shoreline and adapting it to future sea level rise. Planning initiatives catalyzed by the development of a network of parks along the southern waterfront are co-powering communities to lead change in their neighborhoods and economically participate in the investments being made there. So as we make the places that we live more porous, lush, and alive, we must also make them socially just resilient and self-directed. 
We have proven models for how to move forward, aligning our ethical responsibility to create a just society with the urgent solutions needed to address climate change. And now it's time for them to multiply. If we move forward at a scale and ambition that match the challenge, we have the opportunity to not only do what's necessary, but the possibility to do much better. Thanks, Ali. And it seems like we have a little bit of competition, so I encourage everybody um, you know, to project into the microphone as much as possible. Um, one of the things that I heard as I listened to each of you um, that you know, struck me, and um, I'm particularly um, Delphine Semi, um, Semi and Phil, is when you, everything that you were talking about talked about empowering women and talked about diversifying income, talked about looking at different solutions. Um, and so I wanted to dive a little bit deeper on that. And, and you know, how do, and this is for everybody on the panel, if each of you could just take one minute um, in the context of the work that you're doing, how do you see, and I don't want it to necessarily be a leading question, but it kinda is, but how do you see women as stewards as we work towards bringing people and the planet in more harmony. So I'm, um, I'm gonna just throw it out there. Ali, I'm gonna start with you, um, and then I'll just, we'll just jump around. It was remarkable in the, in the research that I did for the book, how many women were leading efforts in their own neighborhoods. Um, you know, one example that just pops immediately to mind is a woman named Angela Chalk, who was working in, um, in New Orleans post Hurricane Katrina. And she ended up being able to direct investments in New Orleans to her community in the Seventh Ward, which had been hit really hard by the hurricane. And she started just in her own backyard by making a demonstration garden and, um, and you know, planting bioswales and putting out rain barrels. And when the next uh, when the next flood hit and she didn't flood, um, her neighbors got really interested in the kinds of solutions she had. And then she brought people together over home cooked meals and she knew her neighbors and her neighborhood. And she's launched um, with many volunteers and many other supportive women and other people throughout New Orleans um, that are supporting their efforts a really incredible grassroots campaign to bring green infrastructure to the low-lying parts of New Orleans. And there are many other examples like that in the book of women that have really led the way. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, we, we have five more minutes before we open it up, so I'm going to ask for some really quick answers. Um, Michael, um, you know, in, in the work that you've been doing, where, sure. how, what role does women play? Yeah. So Silviculture has been working on a grant um, that targets dairy farms owned and run by women. Dairy farms, like much of mainstream agriculture, is, is struggling, lack of design there. And so transitioning into a longer term crop return like nuts um, often needs a little bit of assistance because there's a little bit of a stopgap period. So we're working with and targeting uh, women owned farms that can then begin to transition from whatever it was, conventional farming, into diversifying into the nuts. And in general, planting nuts creates you know, income opportunities for harvesting, you know, regardless of gender. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful long-term sort of employment opportunity as well. Okay, Delphine, would you like to share something? Yes. Um, taking, you, uh, taking a trip down to the village in Masai Mara, for example, I, Women are involved so much in um, conservation or environmental uh, things uh, because of their gender roles. For example, the women are the ones who go fetching for firewood. They're the ones who go fetching for water. They're the same one traditionally who build the Maasai houses. So they are the ones who know what type of tree to go and cut down and use it for um, for constructing a house. So they're also the, the, the people who take care of children and they're also the people who give who teach the children and pass information generation after generation. So empowering women to not just make money out of um, all this economic empowerment program and also trying to link that with uh, 
environment and conservation is really key because they tend to spread information more than the men actually because they will teach their kids for example don't go and cut that tree because of xyz and also uh, we use women and children in mara as our um eco warriors because when you give women an information by the end of the day it will be in the village but if you sit down with the men in a boardroom the information will just be left in the boardroom. So in one way or the other, the women, when they're empowered economically and they can as well understand the connection between the income they're earning because of conservation, and also they can as well understand why they need to continue conserving and passing that information to their children, they can really contribute highly to uh, conservation and as well as empowering the generation after them to continue conserving and protecting the ecosystem. Thank you. Semi, you talked a lot about um, aligning culture um, and indigenous communities and also addressing gender-based violence. So I also around the, you know, the, the importance of women and the role as stewards in the work that you're doing in the Pacific. Could you share a little bit more about that? Yes, thanks, Julie. In the context of Fiji, we, we, we always say, So when women thrive, the community will thrive. And that's how our organization rise beyond the reef. Our entry point to our work in the community is through women. Women are the, the keepers of our, our traditions, of our knowledge. And when they married into other, uh, other tribe, they take along the richness of the, of the indigenous knowledge and pass it on, whether you be from the, from the maritime or the coastal, married into the upper mountain communities, you are the vessel. We Fijians, we don't have any writings. Our histories and our knowledge are being passed down through generation to generations, and, and women are the carrier of, of this. Empowering women is the first step to empowering communities, and um, as we empower them economically, we've, we've experienced in the eight years that we've worked in Fiji, um, an organic shift in gender, di gender dynamics in the community. When, when women earn money, the family felt it, the community felt it. So, Phil, um, a, a little bit of like a double question for you. One is really the role of women within the, the lionfish industry, but also how is that really helping to eradicate the, the problem? Well, let me start first with a, a bit of a shameless plug for a film I'm producing um, on this aspect of stewardship of women in the environment. Um, the Smithsonian Healthy Reef Initiative, which looks at the health of the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which covers uh, second largest uh, barrier reef in the world, covers the coast along from Mexico down to Guatemala, five countries. Um, they have about 70 partners, and they did a gender mapping of the um, leadership of those partner organizations. And they found that for Mexico, which was the lowest, it was around 30%. The second highest was around 40% for Honduras. In Belize, more than 90% of the organizations are led by women. And that's just sort of uh, symptomatic of the leading role that women are making in, um, in protecting Belize's marine environment and associated livelihoods. Now, in terms of the lionfish per se, the women who are involved in lionfish jewelry have become spokespersons in many ways for the protection of the reef. Part of the training they receive, in addition to how to make the jewelry, is to understand that aspect. And then they're like really vocal advocates. In addition, what they'll do is they'll give earrings to servers and restaurants so that when people order lionfish in the restaurant, those servers become uh, vocal advocates as well. As far as, you know, the impact, um, the lionfish are not going to be eradicated but by creating additional incentives for fishers to remove them, it allows for ongoing removals and doing so in an economical way while creating awareness at the same time. Thanks, Phil. Um, Delphine, what other considerations are important to ensure the Maasai communities can coexist in the Mara landscape? Um, as we have spoken about the women, um, the more efforts we are supposed to make towards ensuring that the 
communities can coexist. Um, using the beadwork, for example, as an empowerment, you're working with 579 ladies, and I'm going to use the same statement um, my colleague here from Fiji used, when you empower women, you empower the community. Because out of the 579 women, uh, we, uh, they come from, each come from one household, and the household has an average of five, seven people. So we are empowering three, more than 3,000 people with only 579 ladies. So besides that, uh, you notice the Maasai Mara has a population, the, our population pyramid is quite uh, broad-based, with 66% with of the population being the uh, uh, people below the age of 16, meaning we have more youth, and meaning then we have to start diversifying um, interventions for this youth to be able to find sustainable sources of livelihood. And with that, then, um, the Ma Trust and other organizations, we are trying to bring in uh, empowering or um, uh, having inter sustainable interventions that can be able to empower this generation that we're expecting that's supposed to be, be coming in very soon. Because as I said, the Maasai are pastoral communities. So you can imagine if this young generation comes in and they all want to be pastoralists then we're going to have a very big challenge with our ecosystem. So with that, then the interventions we are having is uh, we are focusing on also the youth a lot with having different youth uh, programs like career guidance to just broaden their opportunities uh, to encourage the youth to also start doing vocational skills like plumbing and le elect being electricians. Uh, because uh, in Mara, um, again, we have to mostly get experts or technicians from other communities to come and do such things as plumbing. So then we are doing a lot of encouragement and opening uh, opportunities with university and technical uh, colleges to come in and uh, create awareness on other, other courses that this youth can, can do. But also one thing that is noticeable is um, for sustainability and, eco and uh, for sustainability and coexistence of the Mara ecosystem, we really need to uh, check our sexual reproductive health um, services and information, because our population growth, are, as we speak, is at 10 percent, with 8 percent natural growth and 2.5 um, in, in migration growth. So with that, then we are at a risk of having um, on our population populated. Um, ecosystem and we're going to have a lot of human wildlife conflicts. So then uh, we need to start uh, having to handle issues of sexual reproductive health by giving the communities information and services. So in Mara, 41% of the girls get their first baby by the time they turn the age of 19. And during COVID, we saw we had very many high cases of over 16,000 cases of teenage pregnancy were recorded. Um, so with that then, uh, the Ma Trust and the Ministry of Health, we are trying to work so hard to empower the communities by giving information to these women and girls and also the boys on the opportunities they have and, the, and accessing sexual reproductive health services for them to be able to make choices about their futures. Because once a girl is pregnant, then her chances of going continue with school are also minimized. So we have very high levels of school dropout once the girl gets pregnant. And of course, um, without education or without, uh, if you cannot read and write, your opportunities of having diversified in uh, sources of livelihood is limited. So with this, then we need to not just bring intervention that are preventative, uh, are curative, but you also have to start thinking about preventative interventions for these communities. Uh, to ensure that they can all coexist in, the, in this precious ecosystem where we're still living with wildlife and people and that, such that we cannot compete for the resources that we have. Thank you, Delphine. And at this point in time, what I'd like to do is really open up the discussion to include the audience. Um, I'll invite you to, um, to come up. There is a microphone up here. Ask your question to anybody of the panelists. Um, I think what we've heard has been quite dynamic, quite inspiring. We know that there are there are difficulties, there are challenges, but there are also solutions. Um, so, would love would love if somebody go ahead. Can I ask a question to the lady on the screen? You can ask the question to whoever you like. Yes. Um, 
It sounds great about the thing in San Francisco. What I want to know is um, they fix up the shoreline, they're going to make the property valuable, and the property valuable means that the people, the gentrification issue, are there safeguards there to for the community? Yeah, it's a great question because it's obviously a huge problem um, we face. Uh, the, the word co or green gentrification has often been uh, associated with bringing investments to communities. And what's been really inspiring about the work in, in, the, in the Bay Area along the shoreline in Bayview Hunters Point is that the community is really leading um, the equitable, equitable development plan so that, you know, that they their livelihoods and economic benefits are a part of bringing investments to the neighborhood and um, and improving uh, improving their park system and access to the shoreline, along with their ability to be resilient to, to the future change. And that's something I found in many of the examples that I looked at in the book. Really, communities need to lead these changes and be a part of it. We can't just bring investments to community and hope and communities and hope that they will be able to be resilient in the future. We need to make them a, um, a, you know, deeply involved in structuring investments in their communities so that they can benefit from them and stay where they are. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? You look like you're dying to ask a question, please. I have a curiosity question more than anything else. Um, regarding the lionfish, I know that the 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 fans are spines, still yeah. the spines. They are still poisonous after the fish is dead. So I'm kind of wondering, safety-wise, how does that work? Okay, so this brings up an interesting point, which is the difference between venomous and um, poisonous. So poisonous is something that when you eat it, it basically causes harm. Venomous is when it's injected, so ingested versus injected. So lionfish, they have venomous spines, but you cut off the spines and the meat is perfectly edible. It's, it's actually really delicious. But when you're using it for jewelry. So when you're, good point. So when you're using it for jewelry, um, the spines are basically heated or dried in the sun, and it just takes basically uh, drying in the sun for a couple of days for the venom to be denatured. But an excellent question. There are there any more questions from the audience? Hi, I first wanted to congratulate the panel for a beautiful set of presentations. Very inspiring and very hopeful. I had a question for Semi, actually, just not really a question, but I'm really fascinated by your idea of abundance in rather than exhaustion. So I would love to know some more examples of how that mindset works. And you know, how do you really make that happen? The abundance mindset and examples of that and how do you make it happen? Thank you. Thank you for the, for, for the questions. Yes, oftentimes in, um, in the global north, uh, strategies and framework are being designed to address issues that are faced by communities in, in this context, the Pacific Island communities. And bringing in the firepowers of the dollars that comes behind those um, initiatives. And, 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 and oftentimes, it's about um, exhausting those fundings, using it up, lead to report writing, and to another report writing, and, 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 and ex exhausting it to continue rather than addressing the, the, the issues. Traditional settings in, in Fiji, if you look at the, the traditional knowledge, um, it is based around the total abundance mindset. They, they, you, their interrelations to, to their culture, to their food, to their livelihood, and oftentimes those are being neglected in this design. When we design framework or strategies to address issues such as climate change or land degradation or, or issue with food, food security. And um, when, when COVID hits, it exposes the the, the richness and the strength of this traditional knowledge. Pacific Island Nation, like Fiji, from one day to another, all the hotels got closed down, flights stopped, people got, got laid off, their source of income got affected. 
they move back into their communities and the only thing they can fall back to is those traditional knowledge and how they utilize the land for their own survival and for, 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 for their families on those two and a half years when Fiji was in, was in lockdown. So it's that lack of integrating the, what has the traditional knowledge and practice that has brought our, our people over the years in those Pacific Island nations are oftentimes not factored in into this uh, foreign development framework. Okay. Are there any more questions from the audience? I hear somebody. Could you, would you mind stepping up to the mic, please, so that we can, thank you. Poor Phil, how did those fish get into the Atlantic Ocean? That's a great question. So unfortunately, um, lionfish are really beautiful, and it's great to see them where they belong which is in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, because they're so beautiful, they're a very attractive and popular aquarium fish. But they grow really quickly and they basically eat anything that they can suck into their mouths. So like the case with other types of pets where people want to get rid of them, uh, people didn't want to just kill them, so they put them into the ocean. Uh, and it's pretty clear that through either intentional or unintentional release of aquarium fish, they were first sighted off the coast of Florida in 1990. And since then, they're just basically, they've grown exponentially because a single female lays two million eggs a year. They lay eggs every two or three days and they reach sexual maturity at a year and a half. So it's just really an example of why we shouldn't put uh, uh, species into areas where they don't belong. Thanks, Phil. Um, yes, please step up to the mic. Thank you. Hi. The, the title of this is Living Landscapes, and I wonder how we're going to shift uh, from this industrial agriculture with corn, soy, and wheat to edible landscapes with nuts and berries. How, how is this transition going to happen? Because ultimately, the industrial agriculture loaded with GMOs and pesticides is poisoning, making people not healthy. How are we going to make this shift to a more natural system? I'd like to direct that to you, Michael. Yeah. Great question. We, our landscapes are dictated by our economy, what's on our plate. What we're eating is what our landscape looks like. So to be realistic about transitioning to more perennial, you know, more regenerative ways of uh, growing on our landscapes, uh, it needs to make economic um, sense. You know, it needs to be economically viable. We also need to look at our diets. We need to look at what we're eating. You know, if we're eating all of these heavy processed annual foods, that's what our landscapes are gonna look like. So there's a combination of things here, economy and culture. Um, Maybe the, maybe the economy is a little easier to deal with, uh, so maybe we'll focus on that. And transitioning, so I, I lived 20 years in rural Latin America, working with food security, food forest systems, and there the situation is that they've, they've been you know, pretty much dictated to grow rice, beans, and corn. Um, and so when you are trying to see how to transition into diversity, you have to take into consideration the reality that they're living in now. And so what we did was we said, okay, we'll keep, keep growing what you're growing because that's what you're eating, what you're relying on, but let's begin to diversify around the edges. You know, around your dry land rice, let's start planting mangoes, let's start planting avocados, let's start planting macadamia nuts. Let's start diversifying, not necessarily completely transplanting what you're accustomed to, but let's slowly begin to transition something new. That creates food security, because when annual crops fail, because they're much more sensitive to inclement weather changing, right? The perennial food source will be there, number one, for food security, but then you create market niches, right? You've got something to sell off season. And if you get like five or six different grafted types of mangoes, you've got them producing at different times of the year, so you're creating income. So once you start creating income, good income, from those perennials, you're like, hey, I'm gonna do some more of that. I'm gonna plant some more of those trees. And before you know it, your, your annual slash and burn crops are gone and you've got a food forest that's making you tons of money, that's holding the soil, that's bringing in clean water and air, creating shelter and habitat. 
You can then produce your medicines and go hunting. I mean, it completely changes the landscape. It changes the culture. So our culture is kind of guided by our economics and by our diet. We can change them both. Thank you. And as we come towards the end of our panel discussion, I'd like to give each of the panelists sort of just um, a, an opportunity to provide sort of one parting message. What is that one inspiring note that you want to leave, ever, leave everybody here with today? So, um, Ali, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the, the parting note is that, that we can change things. We've, we've changed our landscapes and cities to, to be uh, around cars and we can change them back to people and we can employ people in the, prom in the process of doing so. Um, so that cities become naturally abundant in which people have greater economic opportunities and agency in shaping their communities. In short, that, you know, people have, we're finding ways that people can not only survive the future, but thrive in it. Those are the opportunities we have today. Thanks, Ali. Michael? Um, you know, I, I think it's critical time to be creative. And, you know, creativity can also come from just observing natural, healthy ecosystems. We have the greatest teachers all around us. It's not even something we necessarily have to figure out, but maybe translate, you know, bring, bring indigenous knowledge into modern reality, you know, and that's, that's, that's what permaculture does. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a good pathway to learn about and to follow. Delphine? Um, my parting shot is, um, it is time for us to blend indigenous knowledge and modern knowledge to have communities that can coexist and adapt to any type of uh, changes or even shocks, and as well as coexist with the ecosystem around them. Sammy. Yes, uh, thanks, Julie. For us in the Pacific, small island nation, climate change is real. It's something that it affects us, it affects our livelihood, the, the, the traditional season when it's cyclone, there is cyclone, but it's a category five cyclone. During the dry season, it's dry, but it's really, really dry. In the rainy season, it leads to flood. And for us and our, our communities, it's not about the last category five cyclone that we've experienced. It's about preparing ourselves. How, do, how can we be resilient for the next category five cyclone? How do we prepare ourselves? Um, climate change, climate justice, it's not just an environmental issues. It's ethical, it's political. And we are facing it in silos in the Pacific Islands. Thank you, and Phil? So I'd say just a reminder that the two Chinese characters which together um, lead to the word threat or danger, those same two Chinese characters also spell out the word opportunity. So I think that the idea or the mindset of looking at threats as an opportunity for change, an opportunity to try new solutions, an opportunity to turn lemons into lemonades is the mindset we need to address these types of challenges. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And I just want to summarize real quickly the five words that were shared. Change, creative, blend, prepare, and opportunity. So if that's not inspiring, I'm not sure what is. So thank you, everybody, for being with us today. And thank you, Julie Robinson, for doing a great job moderating. We really appreciate you and all of our panelists. Let's give another round of applause. That was excellent. All right, well, while our panelists are exiting the stage and we transition over to our next uh, uh, showcase, I uh, just want to remind you that um, we have a uh, good recycling program going on here. Please make sure that all food containers, utensils from our festival concessions, they are compostable. Please dispose of them properly at our resource recovery stations. And uh, please remember to visit our festival marketplace over on the far side of the castle where you can support um, uh, can support the festival by uh, purchasing arts and crafts from all around the world sustainably created. And then if you can, you can stay up to date with the Folklife Festival um, on social media, uh, where we're sharing stories, photos, videos, and of course our website is a great reference, folklife.si.edu. 
I'd like to thank uh, HHMI Tangled Bank Studios once again for helping to make uh, this session today possible. And our next Earth Optimism session will be tomorrow, Monday, 1 p.m., Rural Renaissance Revitalizing America's Hometowns Through Clean Power. So again, something you don't want to miss. Hope to see you then. Thank you so much.